the IPH lecture, which is co-hosted by, by BAMC. My name is uh, Tobias Kort. I'm the director of the Institute of Public Health. And I'm very grateful and happy that we managed to keep this IPH lecture and made it digital. So the first IPH lecture digital, uh, yay. So uh, in BEMC, we tried already several times and uh, this is the first time for the IPH lecture. I'm pleased and very honored that uh, Professor Catherine Rexroth is uh, giving the IPH lecture today. Kathy received her medical degree from the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland and her training in public health and master public health from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health in, in Boston. She's been involved in many aspects in clinical medicine. She's a great practitioner and she's um, been working in the Brigham and Women's Hospitals in several years. She's also a great researcher focusing her research on vascular factors, biomarkers, hormonal factors for cardiovascular disease, but also for breast cancer. She's been studying these um, association and causal factors in the women's health study, in the nurses health study, and in other uh, large population-based settings. She's been the principal investigator of several NIH-funded research projects that allowed her to study these factors and gender-related aspects. Today, she would like to tell us about metabolomics of cardiovascular disease in women, Kathy, I'm so thankful that we make this happen, that you have time to give this lecture. Welcome to the IPH lecture, and uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, it is a disappointment not to get to meet all of you in person and uh, to uh, see Tobias in person. Uh, we collaborated early in both of our careers, and uh, it's really just a pleasure to be welcomed back today. So, I forgot. So, so maybe, maybe Jess, I, I think in terms of the question from the participants, I, I, I forgot that we have to clarify this. So sorry, I first give it back to Jess and, and then absolutely. we start with the, with the lecture. <laughs> that was an oversight of, my, of me. Yeah, so, so thank you so much. Um, I can only echo, echo to the escort here um, and, these, and these words for joining us today. My name is Jess Roman, for those who don't know me. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium. And we're running this joint event today, and I am in charge of all of your questions. I luckily don't have to answer them, but I will give them, pass them along uh, over here to Professor Rex Road. And so please um, use that button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A to submit questions anytime during the talk. There will be a, a few um, section breaks during the talk, so then I'll pick some questions to ask our speaker and she can answer them. And we'll also have some time for discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you would like to read your own question, please also include your name. And then I can actually call on you and we can unmute you so you can then read your own question. It will make it a little bit more interactive perhaps. But if you'd like, you can also submit them anonymously and I can read them as well. Um, we are going to be recording this talk, so if you do uh, go on record, let's say, with your voice, please know that that will be in the recording. I think that's everything from my side. Thanks a lot. Terrific. Thank you so much. So again, thank you for that very warm welcome, and um, it's, a, it's a pleasure being here today. Uh, oops. I have no uh, disclosures or conflicts of interest to disclose, um, except for my National Institutes of Health funding. So my objective today is really to talk about and demonstrate the impact of sex and gender, as well as hormones on metabolomic profiles, and to describe some work that we've been doing on metabolite associations for both coronary heart disease and stroke in women. And I'm hoping that these kinds of techniques uh, that we're applying within my field of cardiovascular disease might be widely relevant to some of the projects uh, that you might be engaged in. So we'll start at the beginning in thinking about um, the approach to this topic, and it's really grounded in thinking about both sex and gender. Um, so biological sex based on chromosomal uh, male or female sex-based terms, and we know that's associated with genetic, biological, and physiological attributes. And often we characterize sex differences as 
uh, just differences between men and women, and they may also include um, significant gender components. And we now recognize that both sex is a spectrum, that it's not just XX and XY, but in gender, um, this has very much been a part of the public dis discourse, understanding a gender spectrum. Um, and this includes not just gender identity, but uh, really the societal expectations based on uh, how we are per perceived. And uh, gender influences power, resources, healthcare access, uh, many different uh, aspects of life. And um, so when we uh, evaluate and studies differences, as I'll present some data, between men and women. In most of our studies, that has really been based on this assumption that sex and gender are congruent or cisgender um, and uh, have really not very well teased apart the biological from the uh, social or environmental, the sex from gender. So sex and gender differences, we know that every cell has a sex and there are remarkable differences in body size and composition in virtually every organ system in how we metabolize drugs, our hormonal milieu, our reproductive potential and our, uh, our lifespan or health across the lifespan and hormonal factors across the lifespan in women, particular attributes such as pregnancy and, and menopause. But again, I think it's also really important to think about how gender expression also influences um, someone's reality and uh, their health. And that, of course, includes um, environmental exposures and social exposures, culture and role expectations. And for instance, uh, that means that um, in many cultures, uh, those who identify as female are more likely to be involved in um, uh, caretaking activities to elders or children, for instance, both with rewards and stresses from that ex uh, activity, as one example. So if we think about sort of how this influences health, we know that just under 10% of individuals be affected by diabetes, more than a third by cancer. But I would argue, and I've really been sort of obsessed with this idea, that 100% of our patients are affected by sex and gender, whether or not we're measuring it accurately in terms of understanding that impact. And um, we're really interested in advancing a concept of precision medicine, um, taking into account the individual variability in genes, there's been a lot of focus on that, environment and lifestyle for each person. And so um, I really think about metabolomics, as I'll show, as a way of trying to understand both sex and gender um, and sort of measuring the impact of these on uh, metabolomic profiling, uh, metabolic processes, as well as disease relationships. So here's an example from um, uh, left ventricular heart tissue from healthy uh, men and women. And in this heat map, um, this block here is uh, the female uh, subjects and here is, uh, are the male subjects. And uh, there were more than 100 genes that were upregulated in women and a number that were differently upregulated in men. And um, when you look at this heat map, it's pretty readily apparent that the differences by sex outweigh the within sex differences. And I'm making this point because while we know that we should be uh, generating inclusive research, we still have not fully uh, really understood um, in most of our processes, fundamental questions about uh, within uh, or sex differences and sex and gender differences and investigate them in um, a comprehensive way. So uh, for the last uh, almost 10 years, I've been involved in metabolomic studies and um, these have been attractive to me because they're really the synthesis of genome, transcriptome, proteome, as well as environment and lifestyle. And in my clinical world, I am a primary care uh, provider, a general internist to practicing adult medicine. And I know that for my patients, it's this entire picture that affects health. Um, and by being close to this phenotype, the metabolites as sort of a sort of a, a full synthesis of all these factors um, has been an appealing uh, piece to think about trying to uh, understand mechanisms, um, potential biologic pathways that underlie uh, disease relationships. <laughs> 
Oops, I think I missed one. Uh, so uh, this is a study um, from a couple of years ago. And um, surprisingly, um, for metabolomics, there are no comprehensive studies looking at differences by sex and gender. In fact, I'm part of a large consortium called COMETS, uh, the cohort of uh, met metabolomic studies. And we've proposed and are in the midst of launching just this analysis to really create a map of what are the differences by sex, gender, again, I'll combine them here, um, for uh, metabolomics. And in this study from 2015 um, of just about uh, uh, 100, uh, well, of about 500 metabolites, um, more than a third showed significant um, and substantial sex differences. And this volcano plot is looking at uh, the log fold change with these being um, higher in women and these being higher in men. And there were um, more than 180 metabolites that were significantly different. And these affected um, pathways such as amino acids and fatty acids, steroid metabolism and oxidative phosphorylation, all of which have um, been linked to different disease processes. And in this data, um, uh, metabolite profiles were compared between uh, women and men. Um, and you can see they were trying to look at differences both by underlying cholesterol. Here are differences by cholesterol level as well as age. But this cluster of differences where here the blue dots are men and the red dots are women, you can see they're really uh, while there's a little bit of overlap, there are really substantially different patterns um, in uh, these metabolite scores uh, between men and women. And yet uh, very little of our science has really um, delved down to this level of understanding um, sex gender differences uh, in metabolites. So um, throughout my career, I've been mostly uh, focused on um, cardiovascular disease in women and trying to understand what is different um, from that in men. And in data going back to Elizabeth Barrett Connor and uh, more than uh, 20, 25 years ago, um, you know, this is a synthesis of coronary heart disease mortality um, per capita with uh, women represented here on this uh, red line and uh, men here on this upper line. And I've starred, this is where Germany falls and the differences between men and women and the United States is a little farther up on the curve with uh, higher incidence rates. But this is really virtually true for every country in which we look about um, these uh, age standardized coronary heart disease rates differing by sex gender. And in data from Martin Leeming uh, just uh, a few years ago, um, this is the curve I knew from uh, medical school that this in this slide, this blue curve is cardiovascular disease in men. The dotted red line is cardiovascular disease in women. And on average, it occurs about, this is the first uh, cardiovascular disease manifestation using data from Rotterdam. You can see there's about a 10 year um, later uh, onset in uh, women uh, versus men. Um, a piece that has really uh, captivated me are differences in the type of cardiovascular disease. And in this, uh, these figures, men are here in the top panel, women in the lower panel, and oops, I'm so sorry. Uh, blue is coronary heart disease, and the dotted red line now is stroke. So you can see for men at every age, coronary heart disease uh, incidence as the first manifestation is higher than for stroke. And you can see a completely different pattern for women, where there's a slow uh, increase in coronary heart disease here, but by the age of 72, um, the stroke incidence exceeds that of coronary heart disease uh, for women. And in terms of lifetime risk, um, stroke is higher for women um, over the course of lifetime um, than for men. And I would say this particular slide um, has really captivated me in trying to understand why is this? What is different um, that accounts for differences in cardiovascular disease manifestations and locations um, and consequences for men and women? Uh, we know there are also differences in risk factors. This is old data from Framingham, but showing the differences uh, between um, coronary heart disease by triglyceride levels with women here in the red bars and uh, really higher uh, risk at, at each level than men. 
and um, increasing appreciation of sex differences in the cardiovascular consequences of diabetes. Um, and in this um, uh, meta-analysis uh, by uh, Peters, uh, you can see that for coronary heart disease, women with diabetes, particularly type 1 diabetes, but also type 2 diabetes, have significantly higher uh, risk compared um, to uh, men with diabetes, about a, a 20 to 30 percent overall higher risk and um, some evidence of that for stroke as well. So that's really the underpinning of what led to my interest um, in metabolites. In prior research, I had also examined sex hormones and body composition um, and their impact on cardiovascular disease. And so these metabolomic approaches were a way of synthesizing all of these components um, to try to think about mechanisms. So I can pause for a minute to see if there are any questions there and then we'll jump into, that's the preface or the reason why uh, I'm doing the work I'm doing and then we'll move forward to talk about coronary heart disease, stroke and hormone therapy. Okay, so if anyone has questions, this is your moment so far. Haven't gotten any in yet. We'll give maybe That's 10 more seconds on that section, but I think they're, they may be also preparing them for, uh, for the end, so that's also fine. But I think um, maybe you can continue, and then if, if people have questions, please submit them for the next block. Great. Uh, so um, we, um, as I've sort of set this, the groundwork, um, many of these strongest risk factors for cardiovascular disease are associated with altered metabolism. And there's evidence that associations might be stronger for women than men, such as the Association for Diabetes and Triglycerides. And um, in most of the published research, as is true for many studies of cardiovascular disease, even in our cohort studies, um, women tended to make up a relatively small portion of the endpoints that were examined, usually a third or a lit less. Um, we also know that you know, our current risk prediction models, um, uh, while they are good, um, don't fully explain uh, cardiovascular risk. And they're certainly um, the goal of metabolite discovery, um, understanding new biomarkers or pathways um, that are related to cardiovascular risk that might be targets for drug therapy or help us understand um, our understanding of the underpinnings of disease. And as I showed in that sort of flow diagram about how um, metabolomics sort of synthesize the information from the proteome, the transcriptome, and the genome, um, these newer high throughput techniques in measuring a large panel of um, small molecule metabolites can give this comprehensive picture of, metabolo of meti uh, me sorry, metabolic status, um, meta uh, metabolomic profiles, um, and potentially highlight uh, pathways of interest that we may not have previously identified. And, uh, I conducted these analyses specifically in women um, to see if there would be different profiles identified in women that due to sort of the sampling structures of prior studies um, might not have picked up, been picked up given the relatively um, smaller representation of women. So uh, this first study I'll discuss is within the Women's Health Initiative. Um, I'll uh, describe the WHI a little bit more, but we measured metabolomic profiles at the Broad Institute using LC mass spec in more than 2,300 women. This was a nested case control uh, study uh, using incident coronary heart disease cases, um, as well as uh, matched controls. And our real goal was to look at um, incident uh, CHD prediction, um, as well as the impact of randomized hormone therapy. Um, and uh, this included uh, 944 women in the Women's Health Initiative observational study. Um, and in the CHD analyses I'll present, uh, we validated um, our metabolites in initially the Women's Health Initiative hormone um, therapy uh, participants who were on placebo, so not on active therapy. That was 624 women. And then we did an independent uh, replication in the PREDIMED study, the large um, Spanish uh, dietary uh, Mediterranean diet uh, prevention study. 
there are lots of different ways to um, measure metabolites. Um, I know uh, a lot of the European studies have, have used NMR, um, which has um, some advantages and disadvantages. We can talk about that a little bit uh, separately, um, but this is just the general schema for um, how uh, metabolites are measured at the Broad, um, where um, four separate platforms are used um, in different ionization modes to separate um, uh, molecules and then essentially create a, a, a trace of um, their charge uh, and mass. Um, and uh, the platform that we use um, includes um, targeted uh, mass spectroscopy for, um, which has high sensitivity for known metabolites in the hillock positive mode, and then a non-targeted mode, uh, which allows us uh, to really also engage in uh, metabolite discovery where a number of peaks are annotated, um, but there are also thousands of unknowns. Um, and uh, more than 500 metabolites um, are currently available uh, using this platform as well as these thousands of peaks that are not yet identified but um, might be identified in the future and sometimes we go back and re-annotate our data based on that. And Clary Klisch is my collaborator at the Broad, the head of the metabolomics lab there. He's uh, really incredible. So in the data I'll present today, here's uh, just a snapshot. The Women's Health Initiative, um, as many of you may know, was a landmark study launched um, in the late 90s. Um, it was really started to remedy the fact that trials in the US had excluded women, um, and more than 100,000 women uh, from 40 sites across the country were enrolled in the Women's Health Initiative Observational Study, which was just a large um, observational cohort of women age 50 to 80, um, and is still maintained follow-up of that group through now, as well as several clinical trials um, I uh, recruited for this study or included samples from the Women's Health uh, Hormone Trials, and in that study, uh, women were randomized um, to either uh, estrogen alone with um, conjugated equine estrogens or estrogen plus progesterone, which was medroxyprogesterone acetate, uh, if they had a uterus. Um, and for the CHD analyses, as I mentioned, we're only looking at women uh, who were assigned to placebo. Uh, the mean age of participants at baseline was 67, which is co consistent with the rest of uh, the Women's Health Initiative. Um, and 12 to 15 percent of our sample were black, again, fairly representative of the study as a whole. Um, 8 to 14 percent current smokers. A relatively low incidence of diabetes at baseline, 11 to 15 percent. Um, hypertension. Um, they were overweight to almost obese, which was average for the U.S. in this time, um, with blood pressures in the mean uh, 130s for systolic. And we had uh, a four to six-year uh, incidence median time to event for the coronary heart disease events. So um, like uh, genomics, uh, there's really a concern of multiple comparisons, not as large as on the scale of genomics, but um, in this study uh, earlier on, we were looking at 371 metabolites, um, and um, uh, we can do multiple testing comparisons, but um, really the most robust design involves both discovery and then validation. Um, so we performed discovery within um, the Women's Health Initiative observational study samples and found that 60 of the 371 metabolites were associated with coronary heart disease in just age-adjusted models. And after adjusting for all the standard cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, um, basically all of the elements of the Framingham risk score, lipid measurements, um, and directly measured blood pressure, um, 36 of the metabolites were still significantly associated with coronary heart disease in these fully adjusted models. Um, we carried forward uh, all 79 uh, metabolites, if they were in either of these groups, we carried them forward and then replicated them in the same models uh, in the uh, completely separate uh, cohort of women in the Women's Health Initiative Hormone Trials. Um, and as I'll show, uh, more than 30 of these replicated in age-adjusted analyses. I won't go into those, but eight of these 36 metabolites replicated in the fully adjusted analysis. And in the fully adjusted analysis, we have really a different goal, which is to try to understand might we find metabolites that are 
not associated with standard cardiovascular risk factors, and we're really then looking for sort of prediction and um, uh, you know new and novel pathways um, in the fully adjusted models. And when we did so, uh, we found this cluster of eight metabolites, and um, uh, six of them were quite tightly correlated here in the yellow box. And they included products of arachidonic acid metabolism, these heat eicosanoids, which have been linked uh, to inflammation pathways, arachidonic acid metabolism, and then these two oxidized uh, phospholipids, hydroxyphosphatidylcholines, C342 and C364. And all of these uh, metabolites, uh, as I'll show you, are actually quite tightly correlated. Uh, we also found associations for glutamate and glutamine, and um, these previously were associated with diabetes and glucose regulation and have popped up in some analyses for cardiovascular disease as well, uh, with glutamate increasing risk and glutamine uh, showing inverse risk, and um, that's consistent with prior literature. We then replicated these in uh, the PREDIMED uh, study uh, where they had 230 totally uh, total incidence cardiovascular disease cases. Those were both coronary heart disease and stroke in both men and women. They had a nested cohort uh, design. Uh, metabolomic profiles were just available for two of the four platforms that we had, but we adjusted for similar um, risk factors and covariates, and they did not have the heat uh, eicosanoids uh, available, um, but they did confirm um, significant associations for our hydroxyphosphatidylcholine, C34-2 and C36-4, as well as for glutamate. Glutamine was of marginal significance. And that was true for total cardiovascular disease, uh, acute myocardial infarction, and stroke when we looked at combined men and women. They replicated for all of those. But interestingly, um, if you do look for sex interaction, uh, not perhaps surprisingly, because we were trying to find uh, markers in women um, that might not have been appreciated uh, in a combined sample or certainly a combined sample with fewer women, you can see that in the PREDIMED data, there was a significant sex interaction of 0.01 um, and uh, a significantly increased risk in women. Uh, this is for total cardiovascular disease, 1.8 uh, for the C34 hydroxy PC and a weaker association for men. And here's the overall relative risk of 1.4. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, group of eight uh, uh, metabolites is quite tightly correlated. Here is the correlation uh, matrix here with a darker uh, blue uh, indicating a higher correlation, uh, direct correlation coefficient. And um, for biomarker discovery, you want there to be weak correlation with other known risk factors. And so here in the red boxes, you can see this very weak correlation for high-density lipoprotein HDL cholesterol, BMI, CRP, as well as with systolic blood pressure, age, BNP, uh, LPA, total cholesterol, um, really very weakly associated with known biomarkers. And so, um, you know, this really, I think, um, strongly advocates for, um, there's the potential for something within this biomarker cluster to potentially improve prediction um, because it's working in an orthogonal way to known uh, cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, as I mentioned, these, these uh, six molecules or metabolites have a really strong uh, relationship to one another. And they, when we did uh, a partial correlation network analysis, um, these were um, significantly overexpressed or more uh, strongly correlated than would be expected um, on a random uh, distribution, highly significant. And um, when we looked at these eight metabolites, of all of them, the C34-2-hydroxy-PC uh, was most strongly associated, and those women in the highest quartile had a more than fourfold uh, risk for coronary heart disease. And we did find that when we added it to a prediction model, um, that it did improve the area under the curve, modestly but significantly. Um, the baseline cardiovascular risk prediction model is 0 0.76, which is quite good, and it's hard to budge that curve, but adding the um, hydroxy PC um, improved the area under the curve um, significantly.
We then looked uh, by subgroup, and here you can pick your favorite variable, whether it's BMI or race or diabetes or whether or not you're on a statin. And all of these subgroup uh, analyses were um, statistically significantly increased risk to with C34 hydroxy PC, regardless of which subgroup uh, we were looking in, and none of the differences were statistically significant. So um, we found in these analyses that hydroxy, the C34-2 hydroxy PC was independent of other metabolites, weakly correlated with known uh, variables for cardiovascular disease, and therefore improved the area under the curve when added to these standard risk factors. Uh, we did replicate it uh, in, in a separate set of women as well as in a data set containing both men and women. Um, and as I pointed out, there was uh, potential evidence of a sex interaction there. Um, it was associated with all uh, the tested strata in the subgroup analyses. And um, really very interested in uh, now pushing this through to the biologic side, um, understanding these novel metabolites uh, related to oxidative stress um, and understanding whether that can help um, advance our understanding of and treatment of cardiovascular disease um, and potentially uh, in the future um, come up with other biomarkers that might add to uh, risk prediction. Um, I think it's a nice example of um, sort of uh, using uh, sex and gender as a tool to find a pathway that uh, might very well be um, related to both men and women, but has a perhaps stronger association in women, and therefore we might be able to detect it um, a little better with this technique. Um, and so this uh, hope that sex-specific approaches may disclose uh, new pathways. Um, I should uh, just uh, emphasize that these uh, PC metabolites associations, although measured in uh, different uh, metabolites here on the Biocrates platform, um, had uh, similar kinds of findings. Um, one of the troubles with metabolomics were sort of where we were in the early genomic days before imputation and standardized uh, testing is that they don't track exactly one-to-one, -one, but uh, we, um, we did find uh, very similar kinds of compounds um, to what they saw in EPIC uh, Potsdam Heidelberg, um, although this was a sample that only included uh, 23 women, um, and uh, they looked for sex uh, gender uh, interaction and did not observe so, but uh, because of the relatively low proportion of women in this study had pretty low power to do so. Um, so I'm going to pause there um, just to see if there are questions um, for this section, and then we'll move forward to stroke, which I know is near and dear to both Jess's heart as well as Tobias. Okay, thanks a lot. So I've got a couple questions that came through. The first one was asking about um, what the data or results of the sex differences were controlled for. So the, the question uh, writer mentioned, um, would this reported sex difference data persist when only looking out of people of, of a 60 kilogram weight and 0 0.7 meter height who have been socialized as a non-care worker, having a full job at a company, no children, similar stress level, similar consumption scheme, etc. And I think it's an interesting question because I've, I've seen a lot of these papers where they're looking at sex or gender or both in some way. And the question is, what do you adjust for? What's really a confounder in that setting? So this is a great question and I really appreciate it. And I think there are two different ways that we think about this issue. As a researcher, it is very important to know, are there substantial differences by sex and gender in in this case, the exposure metabolites that I'm looking at. And I just need to know, do they differ by sex and gender? Um, and that's important because if I don't know the degree to which they differ by sex and gender, um, our usual methods of, quote, controlling for sex may or may not be sufficient um, for our analytic schema. So unadjusted analyses or minimally adjusted, maybe adjusting for age and a few other factors that we know, age, you know, being uh, sort of all of us by, regardless of our sex and gender are exposed to age, um, makes sense. 
Um, so that's one set of analyses. And when I was talking about the map and understanding the sort of the metabolome map by sex and gender, I think that's important to know. And you might want to look at a, a series of different models. Um, women and men have very different body composition. Women um, across the age spectrum have a higher percentage of body fat than men at the same uh, kilogram weight. Uh, should I adjust for body composition? I would say no, because that is part of the biologic sex of being female. And so two individuals might have the same BMI um, or the same weight, um, but will not have, on average, the same body fat composition. And so this gets really tricky. Do I want to control for those factors in my analysis uh, or not? And I think then we get to what is the point of the analysis. So in the, in the analyses I just presented, our real goal was metabolite discovery above and beyond the current risk prediction models. So in the US, we're currently using the ACC AHA model. Um, it includes systolic blood pressure, total cholesterol, HDL, um, uh, age, diabetes, uh, sex, um, sex gender, um, uh, hypertension, or actually measured uh, blood pressure as well as hypertension status. And we took into account what we would consider this standard model, because that is what is guiding clinical decision making with regard to something like cholesterol, lipid lowering drugs, and other risk assessment. And so for our question, the metabolites or the, uh, the confounders that were relevant to adjust for were those models, those confounders that are sort of predicting coronary heart disease. Um, I think in the models that I showed to you, those are relatively minimally adjusted. I think it would be wrong um, to fully adjust for all those differences um, to sort of, you know, say we're going to adjust for everything we know is different between men and women and then see what's left. Um, in the work I proposed, and I'm resubmitting this R01, we'll see if I get it uh, funded by the NIH this, this next go at, in the fall when the, it opens up again. Uh, we actually tried to think about how do you dissect sex and gender? And, um, and I think it's really tricky. Uh, we do not have good measures of gender. We have gender identity, and even that has been poorly measured in most of our uh, studies. Gender roles are very hard to judge, um, and these other attributes. Um, and I think that's really where um, I'm really excited to learn and try and discover. And in those analyses, it might be very appropriate to control for some of the things which we think are more biologic, let's say differences in skeletal bone structure, which are mediated through testosterone, for instance, or in body fat distribution, um, and to sort of put those in the sex determinant box. Um, but it's not totally clean because women and men are socialized differently and eat and exercise differently and have different acceptable social norms based on some of those factors. And so gender probably will creep into some of those factors. Um, so I can tell you that's a very um, interesting, very complex, but really important uh, area for us to think about. And for us to think about whenever we're looking at sex gender differences, thinking about what's sex and what's gender and what's both of them combined and what we should be adjusting for has everything to do with what the goal of the analysis is. Um, so again, for the CHD analysis and actually for stroke, as I'll present, it's pretty clean. I was looking for things that predict above and beyond standard risk factors. And so I'm really only adjusting for those standard cardiovascular risk factors. I'd be the first to say that those metabolite differences also uh, might be influenced by gender-related factors. And as a side note, I'll say we've done these same analyses by race, um, racial category, self-identified race among women in the Women's Health Initiative. This is obviously a very topical conversation uh, for us in the US right now, and we have lots to uh, address about uh, race, but the experience, much like the experience of sex and gender, the experience of um, race in our country influences how, you know, people are socialized and many of their life experiences. And we're finding very large 
metabolite differences that we cannot make go away, even when I control for everything you might have put on that list, at least to the degree that we can measure it. Um, in my estimation then, some of those analyses are starting to get at. If I really throw everything in the kitchen sink at the analysis and I still get a stubborn difference um, by race, for instance, despite controlling for all those other factors, then in my mind, I'm capturing something that is the social experience of race in what's left, right? That's the part I can't measure. Um, so I think there are lots of ways to use these analyses. And I went way too long in that answer uh, to that question, but it's such an interesting and important question. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think you covered a lot of the key points there. So thank you for that. Um, actually, you spoke briefly about the prediction again. So I'll, I'll just link in this. I'll link in one more question, which was asking whether the gender differences uh, could be replicated. You mentioned you replicated um, your results in another cohort of women. Someone asked whether they could be replicated also in settings of de developing countries, if you have any data on that as well. So I think that's a great question. It would be so interesting to try to tease apart. Um, I don't know of a similar data set from uh, using the same platform that we have at Broad um, to have replicated that in a, in a developing country context. Um, the COMETS consortium, um, I think, is actively in, enrolling, um, you know, additional cohorts. And so hopefully in the later stages of this research, I'll be able to do that. Um, as I mentioned, one of the sort of tricky things in metabolomics is that um, sort of comparing across platforms is pretty difficult. And certainly, um, you know, the studies that I chose, I chose in part because they were all on the same platform. Uh, we are doing that work in COMETS, trying to line up these different platforms. So um, things like Biocrates and Metabolon and Broad and, you know, a couple of other um, platforms that have been widely used. Um, but I think that's a really important point. Uh, my results are from, you know, a very specific U.S. cohort. We did, you know, we did have the replication in the Spanish cohort. So that's the Pretty Med is a, um, with the Mediterranean diet um, conducted in Spain. And so um, we have that, but I don't currently have um, data uh, from developing countries. That's a great uh, suggestion to try to understand that. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll keep the rest for the next round, so I'll let you get okay. back to it. <laughs> great. So um, this next section I'm going to present, uh, really I, I added to this talk because of my long-standing uh, work with uh, Tobias in, in, in stroke, and this is very preliminary data that I presented at the International Stroke uh, Consortium uh, back when we were traveling just in February. Um, and uh, this really was to build on uh, the findings we found for coronary heart disease. And as I showed you at the beginning, I'm particularly interested in what's different and what's similar between coronary heart disease and stroke, uh, which, which women and which men go on to get coronary heart disease versus stroke, um, what's, what's similar along these metabolite pathways and what's different. And um, as is true for much of stroke epidemiology, and so you know, we're thankful to Jess uh, for her work in pushing this forward, as well as uh, Tobias's seminal work. But uh, there really are very few studies have uh, evaluated metabolomics and incident um, stroke. There have been a number of studies, sort of case control studies of, of hospitalized patients during stroke. Um, but in uh, recent data from the ERIC study, which is the atherosclerosis risk and community study in the US, um, two long chain dicarboxylic acids, uh, tetradecanoate and hexadecadioate, uh, were associated with stroke. That was based on a relatively small number of incident events, 114. And this study, uh, which was funded by the National Heart Lung Blood Incident, uh, Institute, was designed to identify metabolites associated with um, incident ischemic stroke in women. And so this is nested um, in the uh, Nurses Health Study, which um, is a large ongoing study uh, founded in 1976, really to look at uh, uh, hormone therapy, uh, oral contraceptives and cancer initially, but now followed, uh, you know, for the better part of uh, more than three decades uh, with uh, biennial questionnaires. And for this study, we used women who um, provided a blood sample in uh, 1988 or 90 um, and uh, 
or the later time period, 1999 to 2000, uh, some provided a second sample, and we looked at incident ischemic strokes, which were confirmed by physician medical record review. Uh, we matched uh, the cases one-to-one, -one, controlling for age, race, hormone therapy, smoking, um, standard risk factors, and we did um, the same uh, metabolite measurements now a couple of years later with more metabolites for up to 526 for this analysis on these four separate platforms, again at the Broad, um, using the sample that was closest or most uh, proximal to the event date. And you'll see um, our initial models were just adjusting for these matching factors. Um, and then uh, the fully adjusted model, model two, also included body mass index, hormone therapy and aspirin use, physical activity, alcohol, hypertension, diabetes, elevated cholesterol, total cholesterol, and we measured uh, total cholesterol, HDL, and hemoglobin A1C. So in model two, we're really looking for sort of a discovery above sort of standard risk factors. And we also created um, metabolite scores um, using um, a linear combination of significant metabolites to sort of come up with an overall metabolite score uh, using uh, lasso penalties uh, for a parsimonious model to deal with these highly correlated uh, metabolites. Uh, just by comparison, here's uh, the attributes of uh, the Nurses' Health Study. Oh, and, uh, well, I'll mention about Nurses' Health Study 2 in a moment, but uh, Nurses' Health Study uh, at the baseline blood sample was about the same age as in the Women's Health Initiative, 65 here as opposed to 67. Um, their body mass index was just a little lower um, in the mid-20s. Um, a predominantly white or even more white sample, um, about 13 to 15% current smokers, uh, diabetes rates of 7 to 15%, and a higher proportion here with hypertension, um, 30, uh, 30, 38 to 45%, um, and a large number using hormone therapy, though we did match on hormone therapy at baseline. Uh, within the Nurses' Health Study, we are also measured um, profiles on 60 cases and 60 controls uh, with ischemic stroke um, in the Nurses' Health Study 2. This is a younger cohort that started in uh, the late 80s. Um, you can see at baseline blood sample, they were much younger, um, age 46. So in that sample, we're looking at relatively um, younger age uh, at stroke. Um, and uh, I'll have a few data which uh, I show. Uh, it's obviously a small uh, replication study. Uh, it was really just done for our internal purposes. And I have some external validation in uh, PrediMed and WHI that I'll show. So in our um, analyses of the 527 uh, metabolites, we found that 30 metabolites uh, were significantly associated with incident ischemic stroke in our fully adjusted model. And uh, this heat map here shows these uh, clusters of these 30 metabolites uh, with a uh, few that we might call islands or lowly or low correlation with anything else. And, um, you know, a few clusters here, uh, 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 lysophosphatidyl uh, ethanolamines uh, and uh, uh, other lipids uh, here, tags tightly correlated together. So overall, um, these represented uh, carboxylic acids and derivatives, the lipids, um, arginine and proline metabolism. We did find an association for uh, sebicate, uh, which is a decanadioic acid, uh, which is similar to the dicarboxylic acid uh, found in Eric. And when we took these 30 metabolites and replicated them in our very small cohort, again, this is preliminary data hot off the press in nurses two, two of these, um, met uh, nominal and uh, FDR uh, significance, both the sebicate as well as methyl uh, methionine. Uh, we created a score, as I mentioned, from these 30 significant metabolites and the lasso model selected 26 of them. And uh, that combination of metabolites showed quite a strong gradient of the uh, stroke metabolite score with ischemic stroke with those in the highest quartile for the score having a five-fold higher risk um, of incident stroke. Um, and again, in the very small uh, numbers that we had in the nurses' health study too, uh, there was a non-significant uh, increased risk, but in that same direction of about two-fold uh, for those in the highest quartile in this younger cohort with just uh, 60 cases. <laughs> 
Uh, we've been working on the external replication using WHI uh, CHD data, the data set I showed you to start this talk, as well as PREDI-MED uh, cardiovascular disease data, the Mediterranean Dietary Study. And when we looked at those studies across both studies, we found uh, associations for sucrose, for C16 LPE and C18 uh, LPE, as well as N6 acetylysine. Um, and those were significantly associated in both cohorts in addition to ours. And then in the WHI, Sebicate uh, was also significantly associated with coronary heart disease, although this wasn't available to test in PREDIMED. And we have additional analyses underway looking at the score in these external cohorts um, and hope to get those analyses done shortly. Um, so in, in conclusion, just thinking about stroke, uh, we found that there were multiple metabolites associated with incident stroke. Um, comparing these to the findings for coronary heart disease that I'd done before on the same platform, they really were different metabolites. They include glycerolipids and amino acids, um, other purines and benzenoids and organic acids. And you know, I think this, uh, this decandioic acid, Sebicate for us, and uh, the ones that were found in ERIC are really quite uh, interesting to follow up on um, since it replicated both in Nurses 2 as well as in the WHI and is really quite different um, pattern than what we see for popping up as most prominent for coronary heart disease. Um, we are very excited to uh, move forward our stroke metabolite score and test that in these other populations uh, because that was significantly increased, uh, uh, associated with significantly increased risk um, in both nurses too and sort of similar direction in, uh, sorry, significantly increased risk in nurses one and uh, same direction in nurses two. And so really the next chunks of this work coming forward for me will be uh, more detailed analyses trying to compare and contrast these pathways and how these biomarkers for stroke and CHD are similar and different. And that's sort of the leading edge of what I'm doing. Um, again, I think there's much to learn about why some individuals develop um, disease in one uh, part of the circulation versus another and based on the data that we know between men and women um, again I think some of this is at the root of my question about what is it about women developing more stroke and a somewhat less coronary heart disease um, so I'll pause there uh, for some questions and then I'll present some randomized data about hormone therapy before we wrap up Okay, great. So just for time's sake, I'll keep it to one question really focused on this section and save some of the others for the final discussion. The question is, is there any explanation as to why the identified risk factor metabolites, and here I'm going to try, C34-2-hydroxy-PC and some others, do not correlate well with the known risk factors for CHD? Oh, uh, so I think that's deliberate uh, because we are trying to control for the known cardiovascular risk factors. And so if we put all the known risk markers, I should add actually CRP was in those models as well, an inflammatory marker. Um, if we uh, put all of those in a model, um, we are deliberately, you know, sort of controlling for those markers and therefore decreasing the likelihood that we'll find them. Our age-adjusted models or more minimally adjusted models did find many more biomarkers that were associated with stroke, but for instance, uh, or coronary heart disease. But if they're also associated with total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol, they're not gonna show up as a sort of a novel marker. And so I don't think it's surprising. Um, uh, what I don't know or what we need to understand are the pathways by which they operate and why they are separate um, you know, from, from, from standard lipids. Um, but I do think they're capturing something different and that would be the goal of any sort of novel biomarker discovery to sort of identify pathways that aren't currently included in our standard uh, sort of risk prediction models. So that's sort of a, a consequence of, we talked about sort of what do you control for? How do you decide what to control for? It really depends what your question is. So if your question is trying to find biomarker discovery and new, 
pathways, then you're going to want to control for all of the known risk factors and you will find things that have a low correlation because that's the only thing that will help improve the area under the curve in terms of prediction. Uh, if it was already tightly correlated with CRP, then adding it to CRP, for instance, would be unlikely to improve the predictive modeling. So hopefully answers Okay, great, that. I'll jump off again. Thanks again. Okay. So I'm just going to wrap up. Uh, this sort of gets back to uh, thinking about sex and perhaps gender, as we know, um, also, you know, hormonal therapy um, for trans individuals is important, and this is uh, hormone therapy in cis individuals. But I just want to sort of uh, whet your appetite for the impact of hormone therapy on metabolites. And um, uh, I was quite surprised by the magnitude of findings that I'll share with you. So um, this goes back to actually when I uh, started as a fellow, I helped recruit women to the Women's Health Initiative. Um, and as many of you may know, uh, we found an increased risk of coronary heart disease, about a quarter, 24% increased risk, as well as stroke in the combined estrogen and progestogen uh, arm and no increased risk for coronary heart disease but an increased risk of stroke in the estrogen alone and again these were oral estrogens which is what we were using in the US at the time and there's really quite surprisingly scant data on hormone therapy use and the impact on the metabolome there was a cross-sectional study in a cohort which was not randomized obviously just women using hormones versus those not using hormones and there were large differences about a third of metabolites uh, differed uh, with 20 uh, 30, 30 to 35 percent, um, but there are many differences between uh, socioeconomic status, BMI, and other things based on healthcare utilization, particularly in the U.S., uh, between hormone therapy users and non-users, um, but there was at least this data showing um, a pretty big impact potentially on hormones, uh, on metabolites by hormone therapy. So we looked at 930 women who were in the hormone therapy trials who had both a baseline and year one metabolite measure. We excluded anyone who had known coronary heart disease. And we looked at these log transformed standardized metabolites after one year of randomized treatment using an intention to treat analysis. We did adjust for baseline levels of the metabolite age, body mass index, as well as their case control status. This was part of our nested case control design. And we were very interested in comparing uh, the uh, active treatment to no treatment, as well as trying to understand these differences between estrogen alone versus estrogen plus progestin, um, particularly given those disparate findings for the main study um, showing increased risk of CHD with uh, estrogen plus progestin, but not for estrogen alone. Uh, I'll quickly skip through this because these are the similar population to what I described before for the WHI. And so we had 481 metabolites available for this analysis. And rather shockingly to me, 225 metabolites significantly changed in the active treatment arm compared to the amount of change in the placebo arm. And uh, 293, even more, changed statistically significantly with estrogen alone. So 60% overall for estrogen alone and um, almost 50% for combined estrogen plus progestin. And this uh, shows the changes in metabolites by class. These are, this is estrogen alone, conjugated equine estrogen. This column is estrogen plus medroxyprogesterone acetate. You can see large changes here. 67% um, of the triacylglycerols or TAGs changed with estrogen alone. A slightly smaller percentage changed with uh, combined therapy, amino acids, large changes, these phosphatidylcholines, acylcarnitines, LPCs, diacylglycerols, cholesterol esters, across a wide range of classes. You can see here for um, uh, phosphatidylethanolamines, it's uh, up to 92% changed with hormone therapy. So hormone therapy is having profound changes across many classes, again, up to 60% changing. And this uh, gives a sense of scale. So this is the standard deviation change in metabolite. Um, and here I've uh, identified um, these biomarkers or these metabolites that had more than a 
a, a, a full standard deviation change um, with treatment, including C18 carnitine and betaine, um, some LPCs and uh, PEs. This is uh, estrogen alone. And for um, estrogen plus progestin, again, uh, a pretty wide range of metabolites. Again, this cluster of PEs um, and LPCs as well as glycine. Lastly, just a different way to look at this, by class here, this is half a standard deviation or more per class um, with, uh, this is an, uh, an increase, this is a decrease uh, per class. The dark bars are estrogen alone, the lighter bars, um, estrogen plus progestin. And really this is just meant to show that on average, these changes were really quite substantial with changes for many of the classes of on average, at least a half the standard deviation uh, or more. And then uh, really interesting, uh, what happens to triglycerides or triacylglycerols? So it was well known uh, that hormone therapy increases triglyceride levels. Um, that had been a worry about increasing risk of cardiovascular disease, um, but not all triglycerides uh, are equal. And what you see with hormones, and this is the estrogen alone, is this increase particularly in these very long chain unsaturated um, uh, triacylglycerols, which are CHD protective. So they're in the protective direction. So you're seeing this, this increase in these tags that are associated with decreased risk, and then no chain change, really significant change in these shorter carbon chain triacylglycerides, which are uh, much more saturated. Um, so this is a tool that can really help us understand. We see a change in the biomarker or the standardly uh, measured biomarker of triglycerides, but um, you know, whether that represents increased risk or decreased risks has to do with um, what's going on uh, at, the, at the sort of more granular level of what kinds of triacylglycerols are changing. Uh, we also were really interested, as I mentioned, in trying to understand, could we see anything that differed between estrogen alone plus uh, versus estrogen plus progestin, and 110 of these metabolites did show differences, and we tested these in our uh, separate cohort in the uh, WHIOS, um, tested these 110 metabolites for association with CHD, and had uh, 19 of them uh, were significantly associated. And the idea here was to try to understand, here's an example for lysine, um, here the green dots are uh, estrogen uh, plus uh, progestin and the red dots are estrogen alone. And then in this column in blue is the association with CHD. So for instance, lysine is associated with a decreased risk of coronary heart disease. Uh, levels go down with combined therapy and actually um, go up a little with estrogen alone. So that would be an example of a marker that might explain increased risk for estrogen plus progestin versus decreased risk for estrogen alone. And we used uh, a lasso procedure to select uh, of these 19 metabolites, 11. We looked at this combined score for um, coronary heart disease and tried to compare what was going on in each of the arms. And we did see some suggestion that um, in the estrogen only arm, that metabolite score was going down at one year, leading to sort of a decreased risk uh, for at least these markers of coronary heart disease. Um, and that was not happening in uh, the combined therapy arm. Um, in fact, that group, um, especially if they had higher baseline scores, were um, going up with increased risk. So these aren't perfect analyses, but again, trying to get at this question of what might underlie that observed difference uh, between these types of therapy and which biomarkers might mediate that risk. Knowing that 60% of the metabolites significantly change, if you're interested in breast cancer or a different outcome, you might have a different set of metabolites that you'd want to look at to say, what can we understand about how these different types of hormones um, might affect risk? Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll wrap up here just focusing on the fact that I think the big takeaways are that 
treatment with hormone therapy resulted in very large, substantial changes in metabolomic profiles across a wide range of metabolite classes, ones that we might not have fully expected. Uh, estrogen alone had more favorable impact, particularly on the lipids, the tags and DAGs, and several amino acids that combined uh, therapy. The C36-4 hydroxy-PC that we saw um, previously, uh, those levels actually increased uh, with a hormone therapy, um, which would be associated with increased risk, must have been offset by other things, um, and it seemed like this metabolite score was slightly more adverse um, in the estrogen plus progestin arm, which might partially explain some of these associations observed in the trials. But for those of you interested in other endpoints, again, I think these kinds of analyses um, might drive uh, efforts to try to understand differences uh, in outcomes with hormone therapy. So um, just summarizing across all of this talk, um, I would say that um, I think metabolites offer this, this opportunity to identify new uh, biomarkers that hopefully might point us in the direction of understanding underlying pathways. Uh, we found um, multiple classes of metabolites uh, independently associated with both CHD and ischemic stroke in women. Again, hormone therapy has clearly a broad and substantial impact on metabolites my profiles. I'm hoping to extend this work to other hormone therapy formulations uh, such as transdermal um, and natural progesterone, which we use a lot more of now using data from KEEPS. And then I think it's just important again to emphasize that these sex-specific comparisons um, as well as pooled analyses uh, will be needed in other cohorts and diverse cohorts in developing countries and other settings. Um, to confirm our findings as well as to sort of understand, advance our understanding of these uh, metabolic consequences of sex differences. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my amazing collaborators. Collab collaborative science really has become the, the most exciting part of what I do. My incredible colleagues at uh, Broad, uh, Clary Klisch, as well as uh, Raji Balasubramanian, who's my uh, partner at the University of Massachusetts and uh, lead uh, statistician. And I wouldn't be able to uh, wade through any of this without her help. And I'll stop there for questions. <laughs>